Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, boy, this is almost like a summer seminar series at this point. So we really very much appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Rochelle Dicker, and uh, and I have the distinct privilege of co-chairing the Health Equity and Translational Social Science theme at the DGSOM. Uh, this seminar series is co-hosted by HETS, us, um, and the Rangel Social Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, and at HETS, our vision is to create equity-centered patient care models in concert with research that centers social sciences, humanities, and community collaboration. So thank you for being with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Helena Hansen to uh, introduce to you our incredibly exciting panel for today. Dr. Hansen. Thank you so much. Um, so we're very, very happy to have you with us for an incredibly timely topic today. Um, and for uh, what I know is gonna be a robust discussion of black and Asian relations and the health implications, I'm really honored to introduce an order of appearance. Uh, Dr. Kay Young Park, who's a professor of anthropology and Asian American studies at UCLA. She's the author of the book, LA Rising, Korean Relations with Blacks and Latinos After Civil Unrest, published in 2019 by Lexington Books. And her first book, The Korean American Dream, Immigrants and Small Businesses in New York City, uh, was published by Cornell University Press. It's the winner of the Association for Asian American Studies Book Award. And in addition to these two books, she's co-written and co-edited three more books. I'm such a productive person. Korean Americans' Ethnic Relationship in Los Angeles, Korean American Economy, um, and Across the Pacific, The Lives of Korean Americans and Their Sociopolitical Engagement in the Global Age. Her current research projects are about Korean immigrant communities in Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay, and the second generation of Korean American transnationalism. So Dr. Park will be followed by Elisa Newman, who's a sociologist of race and ethnicity with a focus on health and reproduction. She got her PhD in sociology with a doctoral emphasis in black studies from, the, from UC Santa Barbara. And currently she's the Hecht Levy, Levy Fellow at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics in Baltimore. Her latest research uses gamete donation as a site to investigate how ideas about race, culture, genetics, and connection to family, back, uh, family background inform the selection of a gamete donor. She also writes on racial inequalities in health and health care. Her work can be found in journals such as Medical Anthropology, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, Identities, and New England Journal of Medicine. And then finally, we're going to have a discussant. Carlos Irwin Oronce, who is a fellow at the UCLA National Clinician Scholars Program. He's a primary care physician in the greater LA VA healthcare system. And he received his MD and MPH from Tulane University. He completed his residency in internal medicine at University of Rochester Medical Center. And his work focuses on the role of the health system in improving population health, advancing health equity, and delivering better value and care. So without further ado, I will turn over the floor to Professor Park. Thank you. I'd like to express my gratitude to Professor uh, Helena Hansen and also Ethel Roxa for organizing today's very important uh, panel discussion. And uh, uh, I, I would like to start with the proposition that our uh, liberations uh, uh, or oppressions are intertwined and also our oppression or struggle is intersectional. Uh, so I think, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so I organized my talk today uh, this way. So first, comparative racialization. And second, uh, I do talk about tension and friction among African-Americans and Asian-Americans. And also uh, third, uh, the alliances and affinities 
And I'd like to end my talk with envisioning racial empathy, care, and solidarity. All right, so first uh, I uh, talk about here that how African-Americans and Asian-Americans have been racialized in a different way. So we do talk about differential racialization, but related, you know, and also cumulative. And that speaks to us that colonial imperialist, colonial policy of a divide and conquer and pitting one group against each other. So, for instance, in the 18th century, uh, Black Slave Code has been applied to Chinese migrant workers. Uh, although, you know, Chinese uh, did come as uh, indentured workers or migrant workers and not, not as immigrants like uh, European immigrants. And in the 19th century, um, at the time, uh, most, I mean, the only Asian Americans were Chinese immigrants and uh, they were considered as unclean, diseased, you know, and carrying drums and unfit. Uh, they are not able to assimilate themselves because they do have their own language, food and civilizations. So uh, they are not allowed to obtain the US citizenship, uh, you know, why it was allowed for others, including Mexican Americans. So, so we do talk about a broadly, quote unquote, yellow pattern racialization. That means that in the 19th century, East Asians, uh, particularly Japanese and Chinese, they were seen like they are going to invade and uh, take over the uh, people in the US and Western countries, you know? So yellow fear and yellow terror and racially and sexually, uh, uh, and I think we can talk about it even, uh, you know, during the pandemic. All right, and also like other racial minorities, Asian Americans were subjected to residential segregation, school segregation, maybe not, not always, but uh, an employment discrimination and anti-miscegenation. Uh, but later on, after World War II, Asian Americans were subjected to different kinds of racialization and what is called Asian Americans as mother minority. It's a myth, uh, but I think it, it was also a way to blame African Americans and other people of color for their subordinate status, you know, so I think that uh, that is in a way a uh, good or so perfect example of pitting one group against others. If Asian Americans made it, then uh, why not other minorities? Right, so first I mentioned tension and friction. Uh, and I think a good way to understand here is U.S. governments, their immigration policy and economic policies, they, uh, you know, they uh, again pit uh, Asian Americans against other groups. So, uh, but I think in the uh, 19th century, uh, there is a huge debate about uh, Chinese immigration because Chinese immigration was the first case of banning immigrants from any country. I mean, maybe the only case. And at the time, uh, African Americans had a kind of a mixed position, I would say that, like Frederick Douglass, abolitionist, supported. But other uh, African American intellectuals and leaders, they opposed. Um, and uh, so again, uh, Chinese immigrants and Asian immigrants, they are being pit against European immigrants and also, you know, African Americans. And later, uh, after 1965, then Asian immigration uh, became a typical case of a brain drain. Uh, many Asian immigrants came to the US as healthcare professionals, you know, uh, like Indian doctors, Filipino nurses, and uh, Korean doctors and nurses. So uh, it was a case of a brain drain, but that's how U.S. government, uh, they required because there is a, a, you know, demand for healthcare professionals and workers. So um, another element uh, about uh, how Asian Americans have been racialized, uh, I think we, we should start with Orientalist racism. 
you know, the, the quote unquote orientalism, that's how Asian immigrants, Asian Americans were racialized as if they are uh, subhumans, you know, uh, they are not the same human beings like in the West. And also there are uh, also a bit of uh, elements of black orientalism. So uh, some African-Americans just thought that Chinese in Chinatown, the way they live is kind of pretty modern, you know? They have weird customs and therefore they are not fit for the US nation state. So it's, it's not limited to African-Americans. It was rather prevalent among you know, people, whether they are white or black, but I think that also. And also um, later on, affirmative action also pit Asian-Americans against others like African-Americans. Even now uh, at, at Harvard, they would say, uh, you know, uh, in order to uh, uh, apply affirmative action for African Americans and maybe Latinx, uh, in a way that Asian American applicants, uh, they they were, uh, you know, uh, limited the number of the uh, Asian American admittances. So yeah. Um, so I think this is easy way to see here how even uh, for the Chinese hairstyle there is a fine impost, you know, and, and so uh, anti-Chinese sentiment and Chinese exclusion movement uh, that was a very explicit and nationwide and literally killing. It was uh, legal, even in LA, it was, it was completely legal to kill Chinese, you know? So I think that that is why critical race theory makes sense when we apply. How come the law was just saying everybody's supposed to be equal before the law, but Chinese couldn't testify against white Americans who killed uh, Chinese because they didn't have a civil rights and, you know, yeah. Uh, so again, uh, they were, uh, it, it was, uh, yeah. Chinese exclusion movement. And I move on to black orientation and the 1992 Los Angeles civil unrest because black orientation has been the most controversial ethnic tension. Uh, and I think I'm referring to not just the dispute at the Korean immigrant owned businesses, but also uh, organized the social movement boycott and even burning and riot, you know, everything. And um, African-American teenager was shot and killed uh, by a Korean grocer over shoplifting uh, uh, dispute. And a uh, Korean grocer actually didn't have to go to prison. So that uh, greatly uh, angered African-American uh, community. For them, it's the same thing, whether Korean merchant or white police officers, you know, uh, when they killed uh, African-American life that, uh, you know, they didn't have to, uh, serve time. So any, anyway, uh, but, but I would say existing literature failed to uncover the central role of white racism uh, in this conflict. It was actually when you, when I reviewed the code report, uh, you know, Judge Colin, how she justified uh, her sentence, then uh, I, I would say that there is a perennial Korean grocer received not a white sentence nor a black sentence. It was mother minority Asian uh, sentence, you know? So, so, uh, so we see here at uh, white media and criminal justice system, financial institutions, you can add even health institutions or educational institutions. Uh, there is, there is a, a really white racism exclusively constructed. So I do talk about instigating role of whiteness because before the judge's verdict, um, my interviewees in South LA, they didn't see much tension, you know? Uh, so uh, these uh, African-American, Korean-American discourse was a triad, not a diet in the beginning with their relationship to whites. And I'm referring to judge's sentence of two for shooting Hollins. Uh, but, but I think in addition to white racism, unfortunately, I was able to identify subaltern racism. So it's different from white racism, but uh, 
racial minorities without white privilege, they also had the prejudices and racism. Uh, it could be uh, at some point very dangerous, I would say that. So I'm referring to anti-black racism and anti-Asian racism also uh, uh, as an element within white nationalism. So. Uh, when I say anti-black racism, uh, you know, uh, I'm referring to Korean immigrant merchants, uh, uh, the way they uh, stereotype and view African-American customers and uh, uh, residents. And also, at the same time, customers also lack respect for the merchant. So uh, African-American customers and residents, they had also anti-Asian racism. I call it as orientalist and nativist racism. Uh, and if uh, uh, Korean immigrant merchant, their racism is kind of uh, uh, based in uh, biogenetic differences. You know, it's like, uh, in a way, scientific racism or biological racism, but anti-Asian racism is more in relation to orientalist and the nativist racism. All right, so uh, I think uh, I, I'm afraid that I'll be asked to, to stop. So I'm just saying here that different minorities, uh, they are positioned in a different way. Uh, so I think this different axis of inequality, race, class, culture, and citizenship, and I operationalize their different position in relation to US racial hegemony, capitalism, and national belonging. Uh, but then that is uh, impacting on different minorities in a different way. And ultimately, uh, it is impacting on interracial relationships. So it creates social political barriers and obstruct meaningful social relationships. So I do talk about racial cartography uh, model, uh, but I think um, probably I think this is the way to visualize how race, citizenship, culture, and class plays very negative role and in the end produces ethnic tension. And it's different from, uh, I think, Latino-Korean relations. And you can see a flyer, uh, the boycott of Korean-owned stores. Um, yeah, and uh, during the 1992 Los Angeles civil unrest, more, uh, near half the financial damage has been done to the Korean American community. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, more than 2,200 Korean immigrant owned businesses were either destroyed or, uh, or damaged or vandalized, uh, actually by mostly African Americans and also uh, Latinx. So it's, Although uh, the 1992 Los Angeles civil unrest started with, you know, uh, Rodney King beating, uh, police violence, not really about uh, Black Korean tension, but mainstream media kind of uh, deflected, displaced it into Black Korean tension. I think uh, today, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, skipping. Um, there has been some uh, progresses because uh, uh, Korean immigrant merchants somehow they all replace their Latino employees with African Americans, and also uh, they appreciated uh, that African American customers uh, uh, they apologize, they felt sorry for what happened to Korean owned businesses. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I think it led to better feelings and then better way to treat their customers and employees, I would say that. All right. Um, it's kind of reconciliation 10 years, 20 years later. Uh, but then, uh, as, as you know, there uh, recently, uh, during the pandemic, uh, there has been an increase almost more than 6,000 uh, anti-Asian hate incident. Uh, so uh, apparently many Asian Americans experienced it. Uh, but, uh, but also uh, even before, uh, I think the year 2019 and 20, right? Uh, when we had the Black Lives Matter, uh, anti-Black uh, racism, social protest and uh, uh, around 1,000 Asian Americans, uh, they joined as part of AAPI for Black Lives Matter. Uh, yeah, it, this was in Koreatown uh, again, uh, yeah. All right, so I move on to 
alliances and affinities because African Americans and Asian Americans, they didn't fight all the time. You know, they were segregated from each other. And uh, there, there are moments that they got together and they were, they cooperated and uh, they also had affinities for each other. So, uh, so like for instance, in LA around, uh, Crenshaw, West Jefferson and Crenshaw, the, the, the entry point to South LA, uh, historian Gurashke uh, 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 documented cross-racial contact between African Americans and Japanese Americans because, because of re residential segregation, even Japanese Americans couldn't go beyond, you know, Crenshaw Blavard. So politically, I'm talking about political activism. Um, and, and then uh, there is also hidden his stories of uh, African American, Asian American amity, uh, Black Panther Party and Yellow Power Movement. So uh, Japanese Black Panther, they joined and particularly civil rights uh, movement activists like Yuri Kuchiyama uh, is uh, famous because uh, she worked together with also Michael Max and also Grace Lee Boggs actually married African American James Boggs and also fought for civil rights and social justice and also collaborated with uh, C.R.R. James. Uh, and also Jess, Jess Jackson joined Justice for Vincent Chin was the recent case in 1980 who was killed uh, by American auto workers who was mistaken for Japanese Americans. So yeah, and we can see also hip hop Rap music is hugely popular among uh, Asian American youth and also popularity of K-pop. Uh, also K-pop, uh, I think in many senses, they were inspired and influenced by hip-hop rap music. And uh, I, I, did, I already mentioned post-LA unrest affinities, you know, uh, uh, both Korean Americans and African Americans. Um, in um, Asian Americans for Black Lives Matter protest and uh, and also finally African Americans are joining uh, anti-Asian anti hate uh, rally. So uh, my last section is about really envisioning. Uh, I, I, I don't want to romanticize, but I think, you know, we shouldn't really forget. I think it's happening now. Um, for really radical empathy, care, and solidarity. So, uh, yeah, uh, different segment of Korean Americans and African Americans, they take, they have a different take. They take uh, on Black Korean relations. Uh, and, um, and then uh, I already mentioned, uh, um, that Asian Americans, they did join uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, but unfortunately, when you look at uh, this increasing cases of anti-Asian hate uh, or violence, uh, actually media showed uh, many high profile cases involving African American assailant, you know, as if, uh, and conservative media talk about as if all the anti-Asian hate crime and incident have been committed by African Americans. That isn't true. Uh, actually, uh, more hate crimes are still committed uh, by white Americans, you know, including white supremacists. But um, for whatever reasons, uh, even mainstream media, when they show the case, then it involved African American assailant. Uh, but but I will. I would say that um, we'll have to, as I uh, already mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, these, you know, uh, uh, anti-Asian uh, violence, uh, who, who is committing and um, committed by whom, then racially it might have involved also African-Americans and Latinx, but also in many cases, they are the people like uh, homeless or transient and or working class or with like, you know, substance use or mentally ill. Uh, so I think it's, it's not uh, sufficient to look at it in terms of even just race and ethnicity. All right, so yeah, there's a very recent case the other day and uh, yeah, there is uh, this, this kind of example. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I think I should have deleted the beginning one. All right, so uh, you see in here that uh, they are saying I'm not a virus. Um, 
and African Americans are also joining. Uh, African American also politicians also, not many, but uh, came to rally in uh, Koreatown. Uh, so I think there is a uh, new dialogue, I, I, I would say that how to fight against anti-Black and anti-Asian racism because the root of these racism uh, might be the same, the source might be the same. Uh, so, uh, so I think in, in a way that uh, 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 now there is a lot of discussion about mutual aid, you know, uh, and uh, solidarity uh, building because uh, as an alternative to uh, carceral criminalization, you know, because I think even hate crime, those things, uh, even you, you have new law, uh, but I think this uh, criminalization has a limit. It's not going <laughs> to solve all the problems or resolve all the problems. So the idea is it's about also mobilizing politically and take responsibility in caring for another. Uh, yeah, so, so I think a care as a collective process of responsibility and participation. So I will, I will say that not all, but some uh, really progressive uh, Asian American and uh, I'm sure African American community organizations and individuals uh, working, uh, I think, toward this kind of direction. I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And so now, um, I'm going to ask Elisa Newman, Elisa Newman, to join us. All right, hi everyone. Let me start sharing. Okay. Are you seeing that in full size or? Okay, wonderful. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for having me and letting me join you here today um, for this really timely and important discussion, especially um, I'm very impressed with the engagement at this late point in the term and enthusiasm. So um, the weight of this issue clearly um, has a lot of interest and so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So my aim today is to try to frame and understand contemporary Black and Asian relations in light of these major developments over the past year or more, including COVID-19, police violence, Violence and anti-Asian hate. Um, the health and health equity implications, oh, excuse me. Are you seeing my, my single slider? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the health and health and equity implications um, of some of these topics might be obvious, but my emphasis is to show the interconnections as well as to highlight the dangers and opportunities of the moment as today's seminar title suggests. Medicalizing threat and blame. Um, so through the lens of race, medicine, and bodies, I'm generally motivated to think through two questions. Firstly, how can we understand these two populations in relation to their histories and contemporary events? And secondly, how can we understand the relationship of these populations to each other? In this talk, I've decided to hone in on the role of medicine, science, and public health in the construction of race and racial difference. While much of contemporary discourse makes mention of race as a social construction or thinks about and recognizes the social determinants of health, I'm also thinking of and referencing the messy distinction between the role of science and medicine in making race seem inherent and natural, such as in biological notions of race, but also the use of science and medicine in interpretation of health and health disparities that are assigned a certain authority and weight. In that latter vein, I'm going to discuss some of the historical foundations of the racial associations and stereotypes we see in these major events of today and trace how medicine played a role in racializing notions of threat and blame with important consequences for understanding racial tension in Black and Asian relations. This discussion will also highlight shared experiences between the two communities of the mechanisms of racialization and even being subjected to some of the same exact tropes in an effort to generate ways to direct attention away from the seemingly divisive issues towards common shared interests and reasons for unity and solidarity in the space of seemingly community specific instances of violence. Okay, uh, so the point of establishing racial difference, especially in the moments and instances that I'm going to highlight, is to make racialized qualities seem inherent, natural, and inextricably part of the relationships between groups and arrangement of the social order. 
In practice, this justifies organizing society around white supremacy through justifying the subordinate social positions of blacks and or their disadvantaged conditions or the segregation and or exclusion of Asian populations and marking them as perpetually foreign. These are not neat framings or claims about these populations. Race making is a continual process that has to adapt to changing times and circumstances, as well as to challenges from and the agency of marginalized limit my analysis to just these racial stereotypes at particular moments in time to trace their salience to the particular present moment. The stereotypes themselves might be contradictory, as with the paradox about the health of black bodies that I highlight here, or we might see the stereotypes as debunked or progress towards dismantling biological notions of race. Um, but really my main claim here is to establish the remarkable persistence and continual resurgence of race-based associations to demonstrate a connection between past and present and the power of activating long-standing racial scripts in ways that service white supremacy. Um, Dr. Newman, I just was, I just wanted to let you know, it doesn't seem like the slides are advancing. Okay. Um, so what slide are you seeing right now? We're seeing your title slide still. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, let me so it's wondering if you have, someone is asking if you've paused share. It does say it's paused. Pause. I just okay. noticed that. Are you seeing a slide saying naturalizing racial difference now? Yes. It's, okay. it's, um, it's in the slide sorter mode. Or okay. It's not full screen yet. Gotcha. Um, I'll make that full screen now. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry that you've missed that. Apologies. Thank you so much for mentioning. Um, okay. Let me advance to the next one. These are these are the tropes that I was talking about um, that are on the screen right now. So let me advance to the next slide. Uh, so I share the image of Raina Hogarth's book and title because it makes the very same point that I'm hoping to highlight here. Um, the process of medicalizing race and constructs, um, constructs the very idea of racial difference. The description of her book opens with this quote about yellow fever um, and the singular constitution of the Negroes that seemingly renders them not liable. Um, when fighting a, a 1793 outbreak of yellow fever in Philadelphia, Dr. Benjamin Rush proceeded from this very notion and assumption and published in a local newspaper this exact 1748 quote. In response, societies of black nurses and doctors volunteered to care for the sick. Quickly, Dr. Rush realized his error as he observed that these black populations, quote, took the disease in common with white people and many of them died with it. Although thoroughly dismantled through this tragic incident, the idea persisted further in the medical literature nearly a century after Lining's remarks in the scholarship of surgeon and anthropologist Josiah Knott, who worked for decades on yellow fever as he lost five of his own children to the disease. In his 1843 publication in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, in which he put forth an argument that the white and black races constituted different human species, he also noted that blacks seem to have a particular immunity to, a peculiar immunity to yellow fever, asserting that quote, during the severe epidemics of yellow fever in Mobile, Alabama in the years 1837, 39, and 42, I did not see a single individual attacked with this disease who was in the remotest degree allied to the Negro race. He did acknowledge hearing of one or two cases in the experience of his colleagues. The point I'm attempting to illustrate here is the profound persistence of this idea that Black people have something fundamental to their makeup and constitution that renders them somehow less susceptible to yellow fever and how it functions as a way of fundamentally distinguishing them from white people in a natural and inherent way. And that this idea persisted despite evidence to the contrary and despite the specificity of yellow fever, um, the broader notions that the races have fundamental embodied difference in the constitution, um, in their constitution is extremely hard to penetrate and remove and continually arises in racial health um, as those differences are observed. Harriet Washington's seminal book contains a multitude of examples of this paradox between the perceived unique strength and resilience of black populations, as well as their ascribed weaknesses, deficiencies, maladies, and imperfections 
Often studies of the resilience of black populations highlighted their physical strength and ability to labor, typically referenced as an enhanced physicality in sacrifice of their intellectual ability and capacity. While clear health disparities, such as high morbidity and mortality was attributed by many to physical inferiority, but especially after emancipation, black vulnerability and susceptibility to disease was often attributed to moral shortcomings. In a 1914 address to the American Public Health Association, Dr. Allen asserted that it is undoubtedly true that the Negro race has deteriorated physically and morally since slavery times. He goes on to cite how the black death rate from tuberculosis is more than three times the rate of whites and actually refutes the notion that this results from the widely accepted as true theory that the race has a particular disease susceptibility. Under the conditions of, this, of enslavement, such a disparity did not exist as the Negro was quote, disciplined, made to bathe and was not allowed liquor nor indulgence in vicious pleasures. Without the restrictions on behavior imposed by enslavement, he argued, it is the lack of physical and moral cleanliness that causes the death rate to be so much more among the Negroes than among the whites. Here in 1914, there's a competition between the idea that blacks have an inherent natural disease susceptibility and the notion that due to behavior and a lack of morals, blacks are to blame for their own deaths. I would argue that in the contemporary era, both explanations continue to coexist as the associations of races with particular qualities resurges time and again and are incredibly persistent. And this is true for Asian populations as well. So the image here is from 1882, the same year as the Chinese Exclusion Act and depicts three specters rising above San Francisco. They're all named for diseases and outbreaks that were blamed on Chinese immigrants in the unsavory, unsanitary space of Chinatown. As Nayan Shaw asserts in his book, Contagious Divides, in the early 19th century, sickness was no longer seen as an inevitable condition of living, but rather as an avoidable flaw. The bodies and physical space of the Chinese needed to be contained as they were seen as polluted, infected, contaminated, and numerous public health campaigns, quarantine off immigrants and this space, kicking people out of their space and burning personal property to eradicate and disinfect. James Phelan, mayor of San Francisco during the 1900 bubonic plague outbreak, is quoted as saying, they are fortunate with the unclean habits of their filthy hovels to remain within the corporate limits of any American city. In an economic sense, their presence has been and is a great injury to the working classes and in a sanitary sense, they are a constant menace to public health. Despite the associations with bad behaviors and poor sanitary practices, the notion of biological race did not disappear. Um, the image here is the title page of a book by a San Francisco MD from 1862, and the name of the, the title um, directly captures the biologization of race, not only through Asian bodies, but also as biological metaphors for the nation of which Chinese immigration represents a contaminant. Another San Francisco medical figure, Dr. Hugh Toland, who was a member of the city's board of health, as well as the founder of a medical college that would become UCSF, declared in 1876 that Chinese prostitutes were responsible for nine tenths of the case of syphilis in the city, sharing how his white patients think that diseases contracted from China women are harder to cure than those contracted elsewhere. Gender and ethnic st studies scholar, Ethne Lubhide, observed the range of publications and commentators ranging from the Penny Press to the American Medical Association that quote, took seriously the notion that Chinese immigrants carry distinct germs to which they were immune, but from which whites would die if exposed. She wrote, the sexual labor of Chinese prostitutes was believed to be the nexus through which germs and disease could most easily be transmitted to white men, a fear reflected in the 1875 federal passage of the Page Act um, which banned essentially Chinese women from immigrating, um, but formally banned the immigration of women for lewd and immoral purposes. So what the Asian and Black population shared through these examples, it's experience of science, medicine, and public health generating or legitimizing racialized associations with their group in ways that justified their oppression or exclusion. This 1879 Harper's Weekly cartoon depicts the shared experience of the being rendered an undesirable population in their respective regions, the Blacks in the South and the Chinese in the West. Um, to the left, I share a quote from Dr. Stout, which captures and anticipates this fear of how continued Chinese migration would impact the West, and the two populations are put together as direct regional parallels. 
Although much of the history reviewed covers a period of over a century ago, I will argue that these particular racial associations and stereotypes have a direct connection to the contemporary events relating to police violence and anti-Asian hate, and I'll turn to those issues now. What I want to illustrate is how for both populations, this process of race making and generating associations render both Black and Asian populations as threats, while also centering blame on those populations in particular ways. To first take up the example of police violence, I wanna use the murder of George Floyd to illustrate how it exhibits the paradoxical conception, both of understanding blackness as a threat through notions of black bodies as unhealthy, vulnerable, and frail, or of inherent In these images, we see contestation over what we would expect to be the neutral facts of medical examination with the image on the left, describing the autopsy report in which Floyd is framed as both riddled with underlying health conditions and also alluding to the potential drugs in his system. Both his faulty flawed body and his moral failing to resist drug use are blamed for his death, all while the summer of protests and repeated instances of black death at the hands of police revealed the construction of the black body as a threatening brute strength and physically imposing. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought with it backlash against Asian populations with xenophobic, xenophobic associations such as the China virus, as well as a rash of assault and acts of violence. While many of these forms of anti-Asian hate and violence existed before the pandemic, the public health crisis has drawn attention to both everyday forms of racism and discrimination against Asians, as well as more deadly forms of violence. The increase in hate incidents against both American citizens as well as immigrants highlights the perception of disease, infectious, infectiousness, and contagion as foreign and needed to be removed or excised. While narratives about the shooter's concern in Atlanta um, in the Atlanta shooting focus on temptation and not disease, the scenario being articulated frames Asian women sex workers around the 19th century notions of threat to white male clientele. Their supposed immorality is what is infectious and taints the purity of the shooter's whiteness. The Asian women themselves are both rendered a threat but also made liable for their risk and danger due to their presumed line of work. Through a resurrection of this same 19th century lens, the shooter himself is victim to the temptation offered by the massage spa as the new Chinatown. The Floyd case and the Atlanta case both suggest that the racialized conceptions of threat and blame render these populations responsible for their own experiences of repression. This shared narrative is what highlights um, the experiences of racism and sincere threat of harm when walking down the street as an Asian or black person. Instead, one of the primary narratives that seems to emerge from this seeming tension um, is between Black and Asian communities as being oppositional, especially around the issue of policing. Some call for more police on the streets as a response to anti-Asian hate, while months of protest over police shootings of Black people have led to calls for decreasing the size, power, and scope of police. The broader issue which includes white attackers and perpetrators, becomes reduced to attention between Black and Asian interests. Attention to the shared ways in which Black and Asian populations are rendered responsible for their own vulnerability and death, I believe illuminates the way um, that deserving and worthy victims are constructed in racialized ways. The culpability of marginalized populations in their own demise detracts from their status as victim, while at the same time, white aggressors are sympathetically portrayed as victims or as being victimized by a Black or Asian threat. Their role as attacker, murderer, or aggressor is explained away by their perception of threat if they remain visible at all. The portrait of Black and Asian tension over policing renders whiteness invisible and entirely outside the scope of this picture. Restoring the focus on shared experiences of racism necessarily means maintaining the role of whiteness in structuring Black and Asian relations. Rather than reductive portrayals of Black interests and Asian interests as oppositional, the common root of both the threats to life and safety lie in racism and white supremacy. Individually, there are many discourses pointing to racism as the culprit. The challenge is to continue to center racism, the role of perceived schisms between populations of color, and to uncover and expose the interest and operation of white supremacy. Um, so I'll go ahead and end here and stop sharing. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Carlos. I am a primary care physician, um, and I've been asked to uh, comment on, on these two amazing talks um, from these amazing scholars. 
and, and speak to the implications for health equity as um, a clinician, as well as a health researcher. And I think one of the themes across these two presentations that um, stands out to me is this notion of, of racialization and its historical roots. And I think, um, you know, this is, we're at a school of medicine and, and for the clinicians in the room, it's, it's I think, critical to understand that our ideas of, of health um, and, and the knowledge, you know, that we gain through training um, oftentimes was gleaned through, um, you know, horrifying kind of experiences um, from sort of this progressive era of the late 1800s and 1900s. And that, you know, as, as both presentations have illustrated, these ideas um, have persisted today with, with race-based medicine. And so, you know, one of the things that, that stands out just, just now with Dr. Newman saying, you know, sort of the invisibility of whiteness and um, Dr. Park also commenting on sort of the instigating role of, of whiteness and how sort of this creates this, this racial hierarchy. Um, and so I sort of think about it as sort of like, how racialization has shaped our idea of sort of um, the health and sort of sort of the composition of certain populations. Um, and I think it's like really important to, to note that, um, you know, at the same time that medical experiments were happening in the early 1900s, late 1800s, um, there was also sort of the building of American empire abroad. And I think, you know, the Spanish American empire, the colonial period um, that the US had with the Philippines, a lot of these um, same sort of processes of racialization were also influencing how we perceive sort of the health of, of um, you know, Asian bodies, you know, in another land. Um, and I think that has really important uh, implications today. So something that happened a hundred years ago, you know, American empire and, and colonization continues to have, you know, uh, consequences today. And, and I think an important sort of link to make historically is that, um, you know, at the same time that medical experiments were kind of trying to um, sort of really make concrete sort of the inferiority of, of black biology, the same thing was happening with the Philippines. And as part of sort of American empire building, there was this idea of white man's burden. And I think that's really, really important that, you know, with sort of European nations and sort of the creation of, of whiteness, it, it also is transnational. And that um, things like nursing schools were being developed in the Philippines. And you know, we often think about today how um, there are lots of Filipino nurses um, and we don't really sort of, many people don't really understand why, um, but it's, it's due to sort of that history of America taking on sort of a white man's burden and believing that they could help the Philippines become self-sufficient and um, uh, have nursing schools and that they could treat themselves. But at the same time, it was also perpetuating sort of um, this global capitalist system where there was a need for, um, you know, labor to be brought to the United States. And here we are like, you know, over a hundred years later. And what we're finding is that, you know, Filipino nurses, for example, um, make up 5% of all American nurses, but make up about a third of nurses in the United States who passed away from COVID. So there are real sort of really concrete consequences when we think about um, sort of that, that history. And, and Dr. Park also kind of mentioned the important role of, you know, this racialization process reflected in, you know, aspects that we would call social determinants of health or structural determinants of health. And I think that, that the historical legacy around residential segregation is absolutely, um, you know, salient in, in thinking about this because um, when, when we look at sort of the, the, the riots in 92 with Koreatown, and um, the relations between Blacks and Asians at that time period, when we also look at sort of how residential segregation formed on a map of LA, you can sort of see that Koreatown is sort of a buffer geographically between sort of South LA, you know, 
Hollywood and sort of maybe the nicer parts of LA. And so when you're sort of bringing in a population, you know, selectively and saying you can only live in this part and you can only have this type of economic opportunity when sort of financing for small businesses was completely locked out for black entrepreneurs, then you sort of see the rise of those tensions. And um, I, I don't know the details of, of this line of literature, but I know that there's sort of growing literature around black entrepreneurship, especially among black women and how that is associated with better health outcomes. And so you can start to sort of think about how structurally the lack of you know, access to financing for economic development has concrete health consequences. Um, and then I'll, I'll make one last comment here because I know we're running a, a little short on time, but you know, then, then I'm sort of thinking, well, why was it that Koreatown was there? Why is it that an ethnic enclave exists? Um, and, and we're sort of thinking now back to how people immigrated uh, to the United States and that their role in sort of, the role of immigration as part of racialization and the creation of health disparities. Um, and so I'm also thinking about how in 1965, you know, the Immigration Act completely changed the, the makeup, the economic makeup of which immigrants were coming to the United States. And the 1965 Immigration Act would have never been possible without the civil rights movement. Um, but it was also a key point in sort of sort of the racialization process because, you know, Dr. Newman and Dr. Park kind of bring up these ideas of how, you know, the, the Asian body is inherently diseased and, and how is it, how do we reconcile sort of those ideas today with sort of this idea that Asians are also high performing? Um, and, and that's sort of the 1965 Immigration Act, which selectively brought, you know, highly educated people from Asia into the United States. And yes, there was some degree of residential segregation, but, um, you know, this was then sort of used as a wedge issue. And, and we're seeing that, you know, today with um, the fact that Asians have the widest income inequality, and that has health ramifications in, you know, the, the health needs of uh, Cambodian, Hmong, uh, Filipino populations are completely obscured and invisibilized by being lumped into, um, you know, the Asian category. And then one final, you know, thing here on this with the model minority myth and its its role as as a wedge issue in Asian Black relations is it concretely impacts sort of um, issues around health workforce. And so uh, the model minority myth is often used in conversations around affirmative action. And I, I've seen polling data that that shows that Asian Americans are actually um, strongly in support of affirmative action policies. Yet oftentimes Asians are, are lifted as sort of a bludgeon to say, you know, if, if they've been able to sort of um, raise themselves, you know, lift themselves up by the bootstraps, then, then why can't others? And, and that has a real effect on the med school environment, obviously, because, you know, if we don't have a diverse student body, then, you know, we don't have a diverse workforce. And as we're seeing in some studies that having racial concordance and clinical encounters is associated with um, patients feeling like they've been heard, better quality of care, and ultimately better outcomes. But, but I'll stop there and, and see what questions there are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drs. Park, Newman, and Ronse for such rich and stimulating, yes, I see hands clapping. Um, reflections on this. And I, I see that Ethel Rojas, our own, our very own administrator for our research team who organized this incredible seminar panel has her hand up. Would you like to kick us off? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Park, Dr. Newman, Dr. Ronse for being part of this panel and giving us your insight. We're really grateful that we were able to put this together in a short amount of time. Um, for me as a person who identifies as a Filipino American, I was wondering if you have any advice on how to shift the conversation. So for me, I've heard my elders in the community, Filipino elders in the community, they're pitting us Asian Americans against the black communities. And I was hoping that you could weigh in on how to bring to light that um, invisible whiteness and how to shift the conversation, but like in a respectful way. Thank you. 
I, I will attempt to tackle that very difficult question. <laughs> so there is a, a real um, sentiment of anti-Blackness in Asian communities. And I think it speaks to the, the potency of, of white supremacy and it, sort of relative proximity to, to white supremacy. And I, you know, as, as, a, as a physician and researcher, sometimes like I can get stuck in sort of a lot of jargon. Um, and I think when, when I've tried to approach these conversations with um, family members, I, I, sort of, I sort of take an approach almost like motivational interviewing, sort of asking a lot of open-ended questions um, without any hint of judgment and sort of walking through sort of some of the logic and trying to find, you know, reasons why that logic may not make sense. So, you know, for example, um, you know, I have heard uh, some family members kind of speak about um, sort of uh, jobs and sort of, you know, people from other communities being lazy. And, and then I sort of ask questions of like, you know, well, what neighborhoods do you think sort of, you know, people live in? And what are the opportunities available in those neighborhoods? You know, what if I ended up going to a public school in this other part of the county that we grew up in, like, it, it would be really, really difficult for me to, to graduate high school. And so just sort of these very open ended questions, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a helpful way that we can address sort of anti blackness in our in our own families and communities. Thanks so much. Um, and I also appreciate your, uh, both of your willingness to share your personal stories because these are issues that cut very close to home. Um, and I, I wanna ask my own question unless somebody else wants to hop in about racial capitalism because I, I've heard examples actually from all three speakers right now of how racism and capitalism have intersected in anti-Asian and anti-Black racism. Um, and I, I wonder if you could shift the lens to biomedical industries since taken together, you know, biotech, pharma, insurance, they make up probably the largest single economic sector in our country. And it's notable that COVID and um, biologized ideas about race are really also at the forefront in this moment. So I wonder if, if any of you would like to comment on how that works with regard to biomedical industries and how we can push back on that as people who are working within biomedicine in one way or the other. So I think on the one hand, um, some of the experiences with like how black health disparities have been described during the pandemic is sort of like a signal of where we need to continue to go. So very much in the vein of explaining health disparities, health inequities, and this discourse of blame that I kind of like overviewed um, and finding fault in bodies, we find like so much competing discourse about social determinants of health. Um, and there's like a slippage between like social determinants of health and when that becomes like a little bit biologized or a little bit sort of like blaming culture, but nevertheless, like there's such a loud contest of that particular narrative um, and so much effort to draw attention towards um, other reasons why Blacks are disproportionately impacted by COVID and why that has happened at various different stages. So whether it was like exposure to infection due to economic vulnerability and needing to work, um, accessing public transportation, not having options beyond that, lack of access to healthcare, um, and, and how that works in disproportionate rates of death, right? And attention to um, what has, you know, medical training done to recognize pain and when our Black patients coming into the hospital and actually interacting with healthcare providers. Um, so I don't know that this like exactly answers your question, but there is of course, this tendency to like biologize and use that to explain difference. And I think very much more in this context, we've just had such a loud um, chorus of people pointing towards the social determinants of health and trying to draw attention to that. And so like trying to tease that apart continually um, is very important. Thank you. I know we're up against the hour, but I wonder if Dr. Park or Dr. Ronce wanna make any parting comments. 
Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a medical anthropologist, so my answer will be very limited, but racial capitalism, uh, is, the concept is coming back because in the past, it was used only in relation to slavery and, you know, without slavery, we couldn't think of even capitalism, but right now, racial capitalism is used more bro broadly than slavery. So I think, for instance, anthropologist Nonini wrote an article uh, uh, even in relation to the COVID-19, uh, in relation to racial capitalism in the contemporary context and uh, how it was <laughs> similar to racial capitalism in the South, you know, some time ago. Uh, so I think this, you know, uh, like even in China, in, in a way that when we pursue development, uh, developmentalism or whatever, we invade like animal habitat. And <laughs> you see, it's like, uh, human beings are invading really animal uh, habitat and their, their territories. So it disrupts the completely ecosystem. And in a way, it includes encounter between bats and other you know, <laughs> weird animals, you see. And then later it led to human beings. So, so I, I, I think it will be a very important discussion. So I would say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think even uh, in relation to my research, Judge Cullin, when she came up with that kind of sentence, uh, it wasn't because as a, a Jewish immigrant, you know, because she was a daughter of a Russian Jewish immigrants, it wasn't like she was taking side with Korean immigrants, but more she interpreted our criminal law and saying that here in the U.S. we have to make sure that people will conduct trade freely if uh, uh, Korean girls didn't have any previous criminal record, you know. So I think it's uh, in a way, I would say that uh, broadly, it's also a matter of racial capitalism. And I would say they really capitalism there. Uh, it, it wasn't like simply just taking side with the Korean immigrant merchant, I would say this. So it, I think really matters almost everywhere. And personally, I'm interested in, you know, how to expand this uh, notion of racial capitalism more than in relation to slavery, I was yeah. Thank I, you. I'd love to make one last point. I, I think it's really, really important for, for all of us to understand sort of the process of sort of reification and how sort of these structural processes lead to sort of concentration of disadvantage of inequality, yet then sort of we then take an ahistorical lens and kind of observe these, these disparities and then biologize them. And then sort of that biologizing and understanding of disparities sort of in the modern sort of healthcare reform era is now being sort of used as, you know, with social determinants of health that, you know, pay for performance, we're going to pay to take care of these inequalities. Um, and we have to be really, really careful about sort of how a lot of that permeates things like risk adjustment uh, sort of algorithms, which patients get, you know, extra money for and, and that sort of thing. Thank you so much. We could certainly spend much more time discussing this. And I want to thank all three panelists for incredibly thoughtful, provocative, <laughs> and stimulating points. They've given us a lot to think about <laughs> moving forward. So thanks again to all of you for joining us. Have a thank good you. weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.